long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, and you not of the flesh, and behaving according to human inclinations. For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. The word of the Lord. Please stand as we sing the gospel acclamation as printed on the screen. The Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus said to the disciples, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge. And tell the the judge to the guard, and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you've made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted into your sight, O Lord, my rock, and my Redeemer. Like I said to the youth in the children's sermon, we need to remember that Jesus is a Jew and he upholds the law. The law was designed to protect us. The law was given to the Jewish people after God has already claimed them as his own. So Jesus here takes three examples and he makes them stronger. Now you need to remember that we don't treat divorce the way they did in Jesus' time. In Jesus' time, 
If the husband wanted to divorce a wife, he said, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and you were divorced. The wife couldn't say that. One of the grounds in Jesus' time for a husband divorcing his wife was she made a bad meal. Thankfully, we don't do that, or we could say if the husband makes a bad meal, I don't know. But we've changed on that, but the purpose of what Jesus is saying here is the law is to bring community. The law is to bring us together. The law is to help us to walk the path that God has called us. And Jesus is saying here, if you have lust in your heart for another woman in your marriage, you've committed adultery already. So he's trying to get you to do things that help bring you together in community. Well, <clears throat> Lutherans have this unusual view of the law. We talk about law and gospel. Luther said there are two uses to the law. One use is what's called the civil use. The civil use is to give us good order in society. No, you shouldn't commit murder. No, you shouldn't steal. These are things that hold society together. You're not doing these things. The other use is you think of the law as a mirror. I want you to think when you first get up in the morning before you comb your hair, before you take a shower, you get up and look in a mirror. And what you see is what God sees. God sees a sinner. For we're all sinners. Luther says that we're both saint and sinner at the same time. The law is designed also to help us admit before God that we're all sinners, we're all imperfect, and that we are in need of the gospel. We're in need of the grace of God. So Lutherans see the law is driving us to the gospel because Lutherans say you can never be perfect. I know that's hard for some of you to believe, but you can never be perfect. You can never be sinless. And it's the gospel, the grace, and the mercy of God that makes that relationship with Christ and God the Father permanent. It is a gift. It's hard for some of us to accept that because so much of America is, you know, do what you can, make it yourself, you don't need any help. But when you talk about your relationship to God, you do stand in need of help. In the same way that our little children need their parents. Think what they would be without parents, or as we saw up here, older siblings taking care of them. God says to us, I love you as you are. I call you to become more loving and merciful, but I love you as you are, and I claim you as my own, and that through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our relationship with God has been restored and can never be broken. Lutherans focus on grace. Grace said is it a gift, you can never earn it. Lutherans say grace is the gift that helps you to be freed to love your neighbor. When Jesus Christ was asked what was the greatest commandment, he does what he always does, he gives a double answer. Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love God, and the second like it is to love your neighbor as yourself. This was said on Maundy Thursday, which is the day before Good Friday. Jesus reminds us the day before he is to die that we are to love one another even as he has loved us and that there is no greater love than that. So let us remember this day. The law is there to protect us. The law is there to help us admit our failures and our sins. But on the other side of that stands Jesus Christ, the loving God who accepts us all. I pray this day you would remember the grace of God covers all your sins and invites you to love one another. Amen.
in Christ you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. most holy faith, pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, look forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, therefore let us be reconciled to God and to one another. Gracious God. Have mercy on us, in your compassion forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. To the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all our sins. Before I start the prayers, I checked this morning, they're showing the death toll from Turkey and Syria with the earthquakes in excess of 28,000 now. I would like you to consider prayerfully donating to Lutheran World Response, Lutheran World Relief, uh, as they try to go in and help. So there's so much work to be done. There's so much repair to be done. There's so many supplies they need. And Lutheran World Relief is known as one of the first there and one of the last to leave. So please think about that and consider that, for there's so many families there that have lost so many loved ones. It's winter, and it's going to be a long and cold winter for them. Call together to follow Jesus. We pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Inspire your church that it may be a sign of life throughout the world. From the exploration of faith with children and new believers to missionaries and bishops, Shape lives of faithfulness so that all find abundant life in your ways. Merciful God. Nourish your creation, accompany all who plant and water. Bless the work of farmers, provide for substance, farmers facing drought and climate change. Guide the work of agricultural scientists towards sustainable ways to feed the world. Merciful God. Give growth where there seems to be no hope for life. In nations and regions where reconciliation seems impossible, especially the Palestinians and the Jewish people, empower peacemakers with your spirit. Where death holds sway through violence, disease, and hunger, equip relief workers to bring hope. Merciful God. Nurture all in need. Bring healing to all who experience trauma caused by systems of injustice and destructive relationships. Give courage to those struggling to repent and those seeking reconciliation. Sustain all who work for restoration. Merciful God. Encourage this congregation. Call us to a common purpose and keep us from quarreling. Turn our hearts toward you and guide our leaders so that our choices may be life-giving for all. Merciful God. Here, intercessions or prayers may be offered either aloud or in the silence of your hearts. I pray especially this day for the citizens of Turkey and Syria, and especially for the rescue crews who are risking their lives trying to still find people. Merciful God. Thanks be to you for the lives of all who have died in Christ. Teach us to follow them in your ways and gather us with them into the promise of eternal life with you. Merciful God, we bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. 
Sisters and brothers, rejoice, mend your ways, encourage one another, agree with one another, live in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share that peace and then receive the offering. Please stand as we receive the offering. I have no acolyte, so y'all need to bring it all the way up. Get some exercise. Let us pray with confidence in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Before we end the service, I wanted to give you an update on the call process. The transition team has finished their work and is turning their reports in. Nick and I are working on selecting members for the call committee. We'll be done with that shortly. We're trying very carefully to make sure we have a nice age distribution. Uh, they needed a senior citizen, so I volunteered Galen. I figured everybody in the congregation knows Galen, and he knows everybody in the congregation. So that would be good. What will happen is once we have a call committee, we need to have another congregational meeting because it's the congregation who has to elect them. And there'll be nominations allowed at the congregational meeting for more people. We want to keep it around 12 or smaller. Uh, the Senate does not have anybody to spare on Sunday, so I'll be installing them. 
and then the Synod will send someone to meet with them and go over the call process. They will gather more information about the congregation. Basically, what is it important in ministry to this congregation? What are the things you want the new pastor to do? They will talk to a couple people from the town that are not members of the congregation to hear what they think of our church, what are the positives and negatives about our church. And then they will come up with a list of 10 to 15 questions based on all the information you give them. And they will highlight, you know, these are the top five things our people have said we want this church and the pastor to do. And they will finish filling out this form, send it to the Senate, and then the Senate will send us candidates. At that point, I come off the call committee because I will not know any more than you do about who they interview. Uh, the unknown here is how many candidates there are. Uh, there's a shortage of SAMs, there's a shortage of pastors, that's why the Senate, all their people are doing uh, church services on Sunday. And so I don't know how long that will take. I do think we will form the call committee this month and I think two to three months of their work, then we'll be ready to start interviewing. But I, have, I, can, I just can't tell you how long the interview will take to get someone that matches what you say is what you want in a pastor here. So would you please pray for the call committee and their work, and they will do the best they can to represent you. Let us pray, excuse me. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ fill you with every spiritual blessing. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you have any questions about the process, talk to me or Nick. He's the council person assigned to the call committee. So if there's something that's not clear to you, we want you to understand it, talk to one of us. And now let us do our sending song, O Master, Let Me Walk With You.